Hello, everyone. I'm JVL here with my colleague at the Bulwark, A.B. Stoddard, and everything is terrible. A.B., today is April 15th. It's tax day. It's also the first day of Donald Trump's first criminal trial. They are underway right now, and the entire universe is trending on Sleepy Don. Yeah. Because I want to I wanna read to you from Maggie Haberman her report from this morning. This is before the lunch break on day one of his trial. This is Maggie Haberman reporting from the courtroom. Mr. Trump appeared to nod off a few times, his mouth going slack and his head drooping onto his chest. In a later report, she, she noted that her his lawyer was in the process handing him several notes, all of which just didn't register with him until he finally... <laughs> That's great. That's great. It it says so much. Um, so I haven't been, we haven't been together, darking out for a while. It's been a minute. And some things have happened. Donald Trump has had to eat a shit burger on abortion in Arizona. And, um, and Joe Biden is rising in the polls, 22 of them since late February. This is a lot of, a lot has begun to change in, in a good way, but I don't think this trial is going to do anything. Um, and not that you and I have sat as criminal defendants in a courtroom before or that any of us, anyone listening to us right now or watching has. I fall asleep before the plane takes off. I can fall asleep in any class, almost at the dentist chair, anywhere. But only a sociopath passes out first day. Criminal crowd. I mean, Think about it this way. When is the real. last time that Donald Trump was in a room for a prolonged period of time yeah. where he did not have control over his entry and exit? He could not speak unless spoken to. And he was not the center of attention. I mean, it's been years. Yeah. Right. A decade, it, maybe. It is. Yes. It, I, I'm sure it was impossible even for him to imagine what it would feel like. And it would, and it, how he would, you know, get through it. But it is remarkable that that he's passing out on the first day of, of, I mean, of officially being a defendant and being in a criminal trial. It's 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 beyond belief. Isn't that that said, this is what old people do. Right? Yeah, you have old people in your life. You I know, know this. He's, he's sleepy dawn. I know. And um, I hope that the Biden Harris Twitter account has some fun with this. But um, yeah, I just feel like even though what you described that things are out of his control he's not managing the show kind of with you that this is going to become like an oj thing and it's going to be when he gets out and starts screaming after you know the court proceedings conclude each day that um he's gonna kind of make it the main event the trial that the actual case is kind of boring enough that i don't think a lot of americans are retuning in um but it I just I have Michael this. Michael Cohen, Steve Bannon. Okay. Stormy okay. Daniels. Okay. I an want. Actual star yeah. pornographic okay. films. All right. I want the drama. I, I want the drama. I just am going to not get my hopes, hopes up for a conviction or that a conviction would make a material difference. How do you feel I just about ask that? You a, I just want to ask you a hypothetical question. Hypothetically, Ding. if Joe Biden was at a criminal trial in which he faced a felony and he fell asleep, roughly how many days in a row do you think the New York Times would lead with that? It would be, the, only, it'd be the end of the election, right? It could be the end of the country. Yeah. We wouldn't have and a country left. The double standards here, and I, I mean, at this point, you're just yelling into the wind when we talk about it, but it's so glaring what voters care about and what voters don't care about. And they've just decided Joe Biden's really old. Donald Trump falls asleep at his criminal trial. Yeah. I wish I understood it. So what they were doing today was the beginning of jury selection. And the most interesting thing is that they brought all the jurors, potential jurors, into the courtroom. And they asked them just a blanket before they did anything else. Do you feel like you can be fair and impartial? Do you know the answer to this already? Did you see the... Did you, did you see the report on this? No. Okay. What percentage of the initial jury pool do you think said they could be fair and impartial? 
a small percentage. Half. Half of the jury pool disqualified itself from the get-go. And this is this is after like the, the written jury selection stuff. So seeding this, anyway, yeah. I, I've been following the New York Times live blog of this and the the description of the jurors, you know, uh Potential juror number 17 is a creative director who lives in Midtown Manhattan and is in, in like uh, uh, glasses and a tweed jacket and says he reads the New York Times. And I'm just like, oh, that dude can't be on the jury. And that, <laughs> you know? like, that's yeah. And that's why I think that a have one always wondered how they ever pull a jury. But then what he is going to say about them. And the process yeah. and how unfair and they're out to get him and it's all cooked in the bands and right. I just, I don't, I, I have no faith in this bringing accountability, mattering to the American people. And, um, it's, so, and, and what I love is that people who once called it a bookkeeping error are now saying, yeah, so we did it, but it's not illegal. Yeah. So it's just so, but it's only a misdemeanor, and the statute of limitations right. ran out on the misdemeanor, and so you can't really try him for this. Right. Yeah, it's nuts. It's nuts. While we're on that, you know, I'm going to flip the show order here because we were going to do something else first. Let's talk about Chris Sununo, who went on to uh, this week with George Stephanopoulos yesterday, and George Stephanopoulos did something which almost never happens in broadcast journalism. He began the interview by asking a question. He asked Chris Sununu, uh, you know, can you still support this guy if he's convicted of a felony? And Sununu didn't answer it. And so Stephanopoulos, God love him, spent nine minutes litigating the same question, the entirety of the interview, until he got an answer. And then once he got an answer, he was like, all right, thanks for coming on. It was amazing. And... uh among the many things Chris Sununu said, I don't know what your Chris Sununu, who I think of as the Ross Douthat of Republican politicians, he, he was like, well, you know, it's this is all people think of it as reality TV. It's not reality TV. It's, you know, there's some some real serious things here, but people don't pay attention to it. And, you know, it, he always comes back stronger. And so why should we care about it? And don't go expecting anything from this. And 51 percent of America prefers Joe prefers Donald Trump to Joe Biden, which is not a thing that has ever been true. It's, yeah. It, Donald Trump has run for president three times and he has never been at 51% in any polling average during any of those years. And everyone needs to read what you wrote about this today. It is on, I mean, it's not it, what you wrote and what you've written about him in the past and your analysis combined with this unbelievable transcript. Um, and I did watch the tape is, is, is just breathtaking. It is, it, yeah. he used to be considered someone of some political judgment, comes from a political family. A rising star. Yes. And reasonable and honest and so brave to back the People thought alien. he might run himself, A.B. Do you and remember that? Yes. And yes. And buck Donald Trump. And he sent everyone a warning last August, not even a year ago. What is that? a little more than six months ago saying that Republicans had to narrow the field because Trump mm. was going to cost them up and down the ballot. Run, he's, he's candidates are this running was, to save this America. This was three weeks after saying that Donald Trump couldn't possibly be the nominee. Right. Sorry, three months. Right. So, so he, he says when, when it is actually in, I mean, the most preposterous thing in the world, he just declares when asked, you know, what are you going to do if Donald Trump's the nominee? He's like, well, he won't be. He can't be. He's like, I don't know. He's leading every poll. No, no, don't worry. And then 12 weeks later, he's like, oh, I've got to narrow the field. Over yeah, and thanks over a lot, again. Big guy. Yeah, he said you that. Liar. that. He's just not going to be. He can't be the nominee. He won't be the nominee. And so he calls him the narcissist running on grievance and lies. And it built his supporters with the retirement savings to pay for his lawyers. And then he tells George Stephanopoulos, first, I mean, it's you. Everyone should needs to read it because he's babbling incoherently. He says we're going to have a pro business economy. We're not going to have cancel culture. Uh, another point, he says that it's really all about um, dealing with all the wokeness um, and all the rules and policies that pound down on the American people. That we need a culture yeah. of change. But in between, you're right. He has these moments that are so embarrassing 
where he gives it away and he uses 51% number several times, which is really weird. It's like yep. this manic talking point that he went into. He was like, I'm going to say it's no, I stand by my statement several times. I'm going to say it's no surprise a Republican governor would back the top of the ticket. And I'm going to say that everyone loves him. And so I have to too, 51%, 51%. The dude's he, own vice president won't endorse him. Right. Why does the Republican <laughs> governor of, a, of, of an inconsequential state need to? But he does right. the hostage thing, JBL, yeah. where he goes, no, no, it's not that it's not consequential. It's just that people see this political. Oh, he, he says the average American just thinks it's more reality TV and prosecution of him at this point. He plays that victim card very, very well. He says. So he's basically. So what am I going to do? Right. He's like, I'm right. in a basement with a gun to my head be, recording this video. And as you know, he has no future in the party. There's no reason for him to do this. It's Trump so sad. Him. Right. All of the MAGAs hate him. Right. Don it's Bolduck in, in New Hampshire hates him. Chris Sununu couldn't win a primary, a Republican right. primary in his own state for anything. Ever anymore. again. And the idea that he had to do this, and as you know, that he had to go on ABC, it's the most embarrassing but depressing and dangerous, as you also point out, because once again, it fuels his permission for everybody else it's just it's absolutely revolting does he have a humiliation kink is that what this is like you know this is his version of uh going to a, a dominatrix to get paddled <laughs> and told what a bad boy he is like i, I don't wanna... i don't understand how a man uh, could do this and just this... humiliate himself on behalf of a guy who hates you for a political movement that has thrown you out and he had the out thing. right first he didn't run for for senate in 2022 yeah. then he didn't run for president in 2024 then he said you know this is my last term i'm just and he backs nikki haley all you had to do with all the things she said in the past that you've linked to about trump is just quietly go away yeah and he's and we're not he's saying from, anything right this is he doesn't have to go on the sunday shows <laughs> that's a choice it, it was it, it when i saw that he was on them i thought he was going to Drop a bomb, yeah, uh, of a different kind, uh, you know, uh, uh, to but be instead, brave. He's a surrogate, <laughs> and it really went viral, and it really um, made it. I mean, it is again just real plaudits and praise for Stephanopoulos the way he handled it. Really amazing yeah. and so important. He he would say, "Well, it's just about the politics. Everyone wants this guy to win," and he kept bringing it back around. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about whether you think it's right. Uh, it, it anyway, it was a Saturday Night Live skit of surreal, like yeah. Trumpism gone. You know, how much it just corrodes your brain. And AB, it's not like we're asking him to do something that nobody else has done. Mike Pence is out on that limb, Lynn's Cheney is out on that limb, Adam Kinzinger, uh, Lisa Murkowski, right? I mean, we we have a bunch of very serious people again. Donald Trump's own vice president won't endorse him. Uh, this is, you know, all, all Sununu has to do is side with them or, or forget that. Just don't say anything. Don't right. affirmatively come out and endorse and campaign and stump on behalf of Trump. On, because the, the danger is that normie Republicans who really don't like Trump, who think Trump is bad and who think, well, I should probably vote for Biden – Chris Sununu is one of those guys trying to pave an off ramp for them so that uh, they can they can come back to Trump. Well, you know, Sununu says it's all about the party. One of the things that drives me crazy, Sununu is like, it's not really about the president. It's about uh, voting for Republicans up and down the ticket. And I was like, Jesus Christ, you can still vote for Republicans up and down the ticket. You can. <laughs> I don't know if Chris Sununu has ever been in a voting booth. But you don't, <laughs> you're not locked into every single, you know, well, I voted for, for the purple party, so I got to vote for all the purple candidates. No, you could, you could vote for Joe Biden at the top of the ticket, and you could vote for nothing but elephants after that, and it would be okay. What's interesting, too, is he could have easily given the hook of the RNC, the fact that resources are being, yes. I don't know if you saw Frank Donatelli, a former RNC chair who worked with John McCain and his campaigns recently wrote about how the, the, with the family takeover and all the things we've talked about, this sort of banana Republic style, um, you know, you have no visibility into the money, the family controls everything. 
that he talked about how this was there's just an admission that there's they they're not even hiding it that they don't give a crap about state parties or down ballot races. And so Chris Sununu could have, without really bashing Trump, gone on and said, yeah. I am so concerned that I hear about all the investment in the anti-fraud unit and all the battalions of lawyers they're going to be investing in for all this post-election litigation if Joe Biden wins again. I really want to know that there's a Republican Party in addition to Donald Trump. I want to know that those races are being funded and sort of just, I don't know, made himself relevant with like a weirdo, but newsmaking interview without doing um, without just coming on and doing a kamikaze, look, Trump is a disaster, and and or without doing what he did. I mean, he he could have done that, right? There is a concern. Ken Griffin, a big donor who hasn't backed Trump yet, but also went all in for Haley, is now earmarking four million dollars to only four House members who are pragmatists, right? You you could have found a way to be on the Sunday shows and sort of express some chin scratching concern yeah. about the rest of the party without actually going on a jihad against trump um but it was so hard given the reporting about mike pence that came out over the weekend uh be- to, to watch someone like sununu do this and to and to the, the pence reporting and everyone should read it um in the washington post is so interesting about like what how he's like gonna do his little foundation stubbornly anyway his little group and and go out and try to get audiences of 13 people who care about reagan foreign policy and the real pure pro-life position. Right. And, um, and it, uh, uh, anyway, I mean, we always go back to Mike Pence, but uh, how Chris Sununo can sleep at night after, after what Mike Pence has done to go on ABC and do this is. So last, last thing on Chris Sununo. Uh, so one of the things he said was that he hates the election denialism and all the 2020 stuff, but that it's about supporting the Republican party. Maybe Chris Sununo missed this, but at the Republican National Committee, they now ask people who are applying for jobs, did Donald Trump win in 2020? And you have to say yes, otherwise you don't get a job there. So, I mean, you know. It is not only a litmus job, test Chris. for the RNC. It's a litmus test for any VP um, potential running mate. Oh, you have yeah. to be an election denier, which is why beloved Tim Scott that everyone thinks so fondly of is not going to be chosen. Um, and you can't. I mean, you can't say, I really think it's terrible that he was had a role to play in the insurrection and I hate the election denialism and then say, but we have to have him back. I mean, it's, it really is irrational, but he's, what does he want, JBL? Does he want like, a, does he want to take it to the convention? Like, what I is? I think getting humiliated gives him a stiffy. I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you. Hey, JVL. It's been months since I've seen you uh, without a screen intermediary. I'm just dying to lick your face and put my hands on you. And so are are you going to come do some public events with us and be among the people? Human contact? Yes. Yes. I'm going to do it. I'm coming out of the house. I'm leaving the basement for two days. May 1st in Philadelphia and May 15th in Washington, D.C. This will be the first Bork event where we encourage jeering because it's Philly people. So jeer us. Yes. May 1st. If we have a bad show, I expect the Philly crowd to boo us. Please. Or anyway, even if it's a good show, boo us anyway. We deserve it. May 1st in Philly, May 15th, 6 and I Synagogue in Washington, D.C. Come hang out. Go to thebulwark.com slash events to get your tickets. Thebulwark.com slash events and JVL. I just can't wait to get all up on you. Ah. All right. Oh, now, now on to our vegetables. Over the weekend, Iran launched 120 ballistic missiles, 170 drones, and 30 cruise missiles at Israel, and basically all of them were shot down. Uh, the interception was done by a combination of Israeli and U.S. forces um, with assist from the UAE and Jordan and Saudi Arabia, who provided intel and overflight and and even some some hard assets. A uh, lot of talk about this. You know, Joe Biden evidently uh, said to Bibi Netanyahu over the weekend, you won, take the W. Uh, I think we have a difference of opinion of the bulwark on this. I think so. Bill wrote about this this morning. I wrote about it a little bit this afternoon. Uh, 
Bill, I think, and I'm, I may be reading more into him than, than he intended, uh, but I think Bill's basically on the deterrence, like, hey, you have to, you have to respond, you have to retaliate to Iran. Uh, and I think that is not wise because I think the way to retaliate against Iran is by destroying their proxy Hamas in Gaza. Right. Um, because that, that is retaliating against Iran, you know, but it's retaliating in a strategically meaningful way. Um, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think that there, there's, it's a hornet's nest, right? So what happened is a win and was incredibly impressive and is a manifestation of years of hard work and careful diplomacy to to protect Israel and and ha- and build this collective aerial defense through a coalition and it and the test the, the, the day arrived and it was successful. It doesn't mean that it always can be if Iran keeps it up. It doesn't mean that is that the Israelis don't feel that they have to respond and they're making they're indicating that they feel that they do so this could easily escalate so if you look at from a from a domestic politics lens it's i mean everyone is hammering on the right is hammering biden as weak and he let this happen and he is aligned with the iranians and um it's crazy i mean this this happened because this was iran's retaliation against israel because israel went and Took shots at a, a Iranian and embassy killed, in Syria and killed, and killed a bunch of, of bad guys officials. and, and yeah. some generals. Which, by the way, I'm all for. So right. Uh, the 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 problem is that they're saying that Biden is afraid of his erosion in his own coalition back home, and that's why he leaked the to the press that he told Netanyahu, "Okay, enough. Like that was great. We're, if you retaliate, you're alone." And right. so that is an easy talking point and, and makes him a punching bag for Republicans who are Trumpy and John Bolton and others. So it's kind of frustrating because I'm with you that it was actually one more exhibit of it's illustrative of Biden's style, which is to deliver and never talk about it. He's very yeah. bad at selling, although that they initially felt right away he had to respond on Saturday publicly, but then decided that was too profound a statement. It was too aggressive and to do something from the Oval Office. And so they decided not to. But of course, you know, the the, the online right is saying, oh, he's been hiding. He he must be in the hospital yeah. somewhere because he so, said he would address the nation. Right. So so what I would like in terms of him on the world stage and him speaking to us at home is for him to just be a lot more rhetorically aggressive about first of all, just tell us what's going on, and and be more rhetorically aggressive about the situation and how they're handling it. He is now calling for diplomacy. Fine, talk to us about it. My problem with him kind of letting the left call him, you know, paint him as genocide Joe and everything is that he he did the right thing on Israel. We have a huge burgeoning anti-Semitism problem in this country. That has not let up since October 7th. And I just want him to talk. I long have been begging for him to be much more out front about Ukraine. I think that he's kind of given up on the American people on that issue. And the American people are with him on that issue. Just the MAGA right is eroding. So I want him to talk about these conflicts in 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 um, a blunt way and have a conversation with us and use the bully pulpit. I think that helps both over helps him lead in in the conflict overseas and helps him politically here. So yeah. I think that people like you and I are reading the paper and finding out what all what happened behind the, the scenes, how it was a a project over over the years, how successful it was. I don't count on the American people to understand what happened and I think that he really as president needs to be very clear about it. 51%. Yeah. Um yeah, I uh I mean you can't count on the Republicans, to be honest, about any of this stuff. It, it's of like not. the State of the Union, right? The morning of the State of the Union speech, the Republicans were all like, oh, we'll even be able to stay awake. And then Joe Biden comes out and gives this energetic, fiery speech. And they're like, oh, look how angry he was. That's unpresidential. Like, you, you know, 
you can't please them. There's nothing you can do that's right. Uh, I think, again, putting the politics of it, everything aside, on the geostrategic merits, Biden is correct. There is no reason for Israel to respond by attacking military targets in Iran. And in fact, that's a distraction to them. What they need to do is is finish the job in Gaza, right? You've, you've got to eliminate Hamas root and branch. You can't leave anything, any part of their infrastructure or, or leadership or any assets left. Uh, and, and that's because otherwise to, to not achieve that now, you get the worst of all worlds. You have to rebuild Gaza, but you you have left the cancer cells still there in in the in the area. But uh, you know, I, I look at this and I am incredibly hopeful by the fact that the Saudis, the Jordanians, and the yeah. UAE were all on board. When we are six months into a very brutal war in which thirty thousand innocent Palestinians have been killed, uh, which you know whatever it's just it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. It's an absolute tragedy. And, you know, maybe Israel could have done better around the margins with tighter rules of engagement or something like that. But this is this was written in the stars the minute that the attacks on October 7 happened, that something like this, some tragedy like this was going to take place. And the fact that, you know, some of these Arab states are still recognizing that Iran is much more dangerous to regional stability than Israel and are willing to work with Israel suggests that it might be possible for Israel to get it, to get their cake and eat it too, right? And and the, the cake is to to eliminate Hamas, which again, if Hamas is out of business in Gaza, is a huge blow to Iran. But to then also continue the, the progress that was made in the Abraham Accords of normalizing relations, yeah. and the big one is with Saudi Arabia. If they normalize relations with the Saudis. Um, I mean, that unlocks all sorts of possibilities for, for new stability in the region. And would be great for Israel, great for America, great for, I mean, God, you know, it's a sliding scale. So talking yeah. about having a deal with uh, MBS as being good for liberalism and human rights is a little weird. But it would be it would be good for everybody in the region. And I think that's hopeful. And I came out of this thinking things might be slightly better over there than I had feared. I think so, too, because of the success of that alliance. But back to politically speaking and i i know you guys debated this on the next level i i am with you that the goal has to be to eradicate hamas so that you you can begin to repair and 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 then as you said it might take decades and it won't be quick but that's the only way you can begin i just want because netanyahu is not a good partner I really think, again, that Joe Biden needs to tell us what successes the Israelis have had against Hamas in the goal of eliminating Hamas to encourage our encouragement. I mean, that that that's what I think is kind of missing is that people are starting, again, I don't know how informed everybody is, but, you know, is they're not. Most of us anticipate this going on and on and yeah. not wrapping up soon and not seeing a ceasefire in the summer or something. What, what is, we know the end game. How close are they? How far are they? How much progress have they made? And I just think that Biden, because he continues to maintain such loyal support and he's a steadfast partner. Yes, he criticizes BB. Yes, he tells him things privately that he's doing wrong. Yes, he's called for restraint publicly, but he needs to tell us because this is an important election and we're in the middle of something that could widen regionally into something really scary. Um, he can brag about this coalition and this alliance and the success of this operation, but he can also address what's going on with that conflict. And he can be a critic a bit of, of the rules of engagement or what, whatever the, the campaign it has that, that the Israelis have executed has brought to the region, but he, if he's with them and they're making progress, he really needs to tell the voters why. Got to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, all right. AB, it was good for us to be back together. Thank you. We'll do it again next Always week. Always great to be with you. In the meantime, good luck, America. 